Hi, I'm Catherine Hill and I'm the UK Director at Care for the Family and welcome to Spring Harvest Home Thought for the Day this week. In these difficult times when so much has been stripped back, where there's unrest, uncertainty, when so many things that we previously took for granted just aren't there anymore, perhaps more than ever, we need to pay attention to our inner lives. And so this week, we're going to use Psalm 131 to do just that and to ask ourselves the question, is it well with my soul? Let me read the psalm to you now. Psalm 131. My heart is not proud, O Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. But I have stilled and quietened my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord, both now and forevermore. So the Bible says that our, our soul is the wellspring of life and how we nurture and care for our souls really matters. It makes a difference to the way that we live, particularly in these challenging times. Well, a number of years ago, I experienced my own season of lockdown. A sports accident left me with a broken pelvis, and whilst the rest of the world continued as normal, I found myself confined to our flat round the clock for the best part of eight weeks. And as frustrating and annoying as those couple of months were, looking back, I realised that there were many positives, what the Bible calls treasures in the darkness things I wouldn't have learnt without that experience. And one of the most memorable um, was it gave me the opportunity to reread C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia, books I had loved as a child and which as an adult, I think I would still nominate as my desert island read. And in The Lion, the Witch and The Wardrobe, uh, one of the best known books, uh, many of you will remember the four children, Peter, Susan, Edmund and Lucy. They're sent away to live in an old country house to escape the bombings in London during the Second World War. And while they're there, they climb into a wardrobe and they find themselves stepping through into the deep magic of the world of Narnia where many adventures await them. And the wardrobe in the story, it, it represents a space between two worlds, what has become known as a liminal space. A liminal space is a waiting area between one point in time and the next. It's a, a threshold between the old season and the new. And in a way, COVID-19 has catapulted us into that kind of space, forcing us to realign our priorities, to recalibrate our lives. For many of us, things are difficult. We might be suffering illness or bereavement, um, job loss, our finances may be stretched. But it has also given us the rare opportunity to pause, to think about what, what are the things that are important to us? How do we want to live afterwards? Whatever our experience at the moment, it's a really good time for many of us just to reflect on the sheer pace of our 24 seven always on lives and what living at that pace can do to our souls. There's a well-known story of a traveller visiting the Himalayas and engaging a group of Sherpas and guides. Hoping to get to the destination quickly, she was really pleased with how many miles they covered over the first two days. But on the third day, in the middle of the afternoon, all the Sherpas simply took off their bags, sat down and refused to move. Nothing she could do would make them budge an inch. And she was mad. They needed to keep moving. They'd lose all the progress that they'd made. And she asked the leader of the group what was going on. Why wouldn't they move? And he said this. He said, we've traveled too fast, too far. And now we need to wait for our souls to catch up. And perhaps today we have that opportunity to pause and to let our souls catch up. As the psalmist says, to calm and to quiet our souls. It's been said that hurry is the greatest enemy of spiritual life in our day. And the fact we live in a digital age means we're not only living lives in a hurry, but we are distracted. 
there are obviously huge advantages, but those little devices, they so easily take over our lives. We live in what's called an attention economy. So the greatest commodity that all the tech giants are after, it's no longer minerals or gold or precious metals, but it's our attention. Those little red notifications designed to be that color to grab our attention, they, they interrupt our day. Video conferencing has just added another layer to that. And many of us are spending many, many hours now on screens, more than ever before, Zoom calls from work, connecting with family and friends in the evening. We're distracted and we're often hurried. And living distracted and hurried lives, it can damage our souls. And certainly for me, the uncomfortable truth I've had to face is that Busyness might give me that sense of purpose and significance, but also it can chip away at the things that are most important in life. Because whilst we can do some things in a hurry, relationships take time. Love takes time. Our friendship with God takes time. Author John Ortberg, he tells a story of calling his mentor, Dallas Willard. John had just taken on a role at a, a big church where he said the whole number of staff was bigger than his present congregation. And he asked Dallas what was his wisdom for fruitfulness in ministry. He asked the question and then he said there was a very long pause. Dallas said you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. John said, okay, he said, I've written that one down. Uh, that's a good one. Now, what else is there? He said, I've got many things to do. This was a, a long distance call. And he said he was anxious to cram as many units of spiritual wisdom into the least amount of time possible. But there was another long pause. There is nothing else, he said. You must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. I thought a lot about that. A light bulb moment for me was when I grasped the difference between busyness and hurry. And I think this is really important because being busy is an outward condition. And it's about when we have lots of things to do and it is an inevitable part of life. We each have different capacities and we'd be wise to recognize that, to be in control of our diaries and to slow down when we can. But hurry is something different. Hurry is an inner condition. A condition of the soul. Hurry is about being so preoccupied with myself and my life, being so distracted that I'm unable to be fully present with God, with others, and even with myself. Jesus may not have had the distraction of an iPhone, but Jesus was busy. He was busy, but he was never hurried. We read in the gospel, so many people came to him, sometimes he couldn't even eat. He'd be walking through a crowd and he'd stop and he'd ask, who touched me? He gave the woman dignity and attention. He knew the power of a rhythm of life that meant that he gave people his attention in the moment. He lived in connection with his father. He lived from a rested soul and he calls us to do the same. It's the last hours of Jesus's life in 24 hours He's going to be dead and buried. And what is it that he chooses to talk to his disciples about? It's in John uh, 15. And he, he says this. He says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Now that word remain, or in some translations, abiding, in the Greek it's meno, and it means make our home, make our home in. Jesus mentions it 10 times in this passage, and when he mentions something uh, that often, I think we need to pay attention. I, I love the message translation of this, which says this, live in me, make your home in me just as I do in you. In the same way that a branch uh, can't bear grapes by itself, but only by being joined to the vine, you can't bear fruit unless you are joined with me. Jesus is talking about living in such a way that the anchor point of our lives is awareness and connection with God. 
I remember some time ago a man contacted us at Care for the Family and he wanted to talk about his marriage. He said in so many ways we still love each other. But what has come about is what he called a creeping separateness in our relationship. He said it wasn't sudden, we just drifted into it. And the truth is, that creeping separateness can creep into any relationship, in our friendships, in our marriage, but in our relationship with God. I remember a season like that in our own marriage when it felt like we were just living parallel lives and a wise person asked us this question, are you making time for each other? Making time for each other is sometimes fun, sometimes it's a duty. But the truth is much of love is the duty to make space for a relationship and it's the same in our friendship with Jesus. Unlike those little red notifications that pop up on our phone, generally God won't compete for our attention. And this is simply about being intentional, making time and space for God. I wonder what might that look like for you with the responsibilities, with the challenges, with the rhythms of living uh, that shape your day. There's a lovely story about Susanna Wesley, who was the mother of John and Charles Wesley. She had 11 children, so by anyone's book, she was distracted and busy. But she had learned to quiet her soul right in the busyness of family life in the home. And she'd sit in a chair and then she'd get her apron and she'd put it over her head. And when she did that, her children knew she was praying and wasn't to be disturbed. Perhaps we can take a moment today just to pause, to be still, to quiet our souls. And when we find ways of living that work for us like that, I love what author Dallas Willard says. He says, soon our minds will return to God as the needle of a compass continually returns to the north. And we'll be able to say that although there's turmoil all around, and of course we have concerns, maybe even sadness, that we know in the very depths of our being that we're able to say, it is well with my soul.